Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Edward Guimont, who is a assistant press professor of history at BCC. Um, he received his PhD in history from the University of Connecticut. With uh, His dissertation was on Z Zimbabwe history. And so today he's going to be giving a talk on genocide in Zimbabwe. Welcome to Dr. Guimont. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction to Dr. Semenega for that <laughs> very uh, uh, wonderful, very intense uh, first talk. So uh, as uh, uh, Ariel said, you know, my background was and uh, did my dissertation on Zimbabwean history. And so uh, basically a lot of the colonial era history and how a lot of the uh, different uh, waves of colonizing powers in the area that is now Zimbabwe have come and uh, interpreted the history of that country, rather uh, falsified the history of that country to justify various political aims. Uh, to give kind of a general overview of uh, the country of Zimbabwe, there are two major ethnic groups there, the Shona and the Ndebele, uh, who in English historiography called the Matabele also. Uh, the Shona kingdoms had historically dominated uh, uh, one of the major ones from around the 11th through the 15th century was a kingdom located or uh, uh, headquartered at the city of Great Zimbabwe, which you can see an aerial photograph of here. And this was the largest pre-colonial uh, settlement in sub-Saharan Africa. It's abandoned uh, at the end of the 15th century, mainly due to environmental uh, issues. And again, you know, environmental changes have a major impact on you know, political, social movements. But uh, the ruins were then, uh, quote, you know, discovered by Europeans in the 19th century. And much like the Hamitic theory in uh, uh, Rwanda, it was believed that, you know, a giant, you know, very advanced city, uh, it's, the masonry is entirely done without mortar, so it's incredibly uh, well designed. Obviously, this couldn't have been the work of Africans, and so therefore, it was, you know, claimed that ancient Europeans had come to uh, southern Africa built this city. It's typically associated with uh, uh, King Solomon from the Old Testament. It was believed to be his city of Ophir, where he mined and brought materials back to the Second Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and so this is uh, kind of like studied by waves of different settlers, first the Arabs, then the Portuguese. It kind of fades from history for a while. Uh, and then in the 1870s, a German uh, self-educated Bible scholar named Karl Mach, quote, rediscovers Great Zimbabwe, uh, which sets on this kind of trail of uh, efforts to m mine the area. Because it was believed if King Solomon had mined it in the past, then there must be a lot of wealth that was still there for various Europeans to occupy. Uh, in 1888, the English businessman Cecil Rhodes establishes the De Beers Mining Company uh, in South Africa, the region that will eventually become South Africa. And De Beers is primarily a diamond company, but Rhodes wants to set his sights elsewhere. He decides he can mine a lot of gold in the region at the time is called Zambesia because of the Zambezi River. Uh, these gold fields had been uh, reported by Karl Maka. Uh, that's what he was officially employed to be doing in the region of a modern Zimbabwe, uh, but he's working for the Dutch settlers in the region, the so-called Boer Republics. And so uh, there's a big problem where, you know, to Cecil Rhodes, he wants to mine these areas. The Dutch settlers aren't too willing to let him. And so Cecil Rhodes decides he's going to, you know, basically engineer wars with the Boer Republics to get access to this. Uh, and this involves kind of a policy of encircling uh, the Dutch settlements that are to the north of South Africa. Uh, this sets off uh, kind of a chain of events beginning with the establishment by Rhodes of the British South Africa Company, or the BSAC, which is given a charter by the British uh, to occupy regions that they call Mashona Land and Matabele Land in 1889. Uh, in 1890, Rhodes sends off this big expedition to occupy these regions, which ultimately sets off uh, what's called the First Matabele War of 1893 to 94 in uh, the western part of what is now Zimbabwe. And this was an area that was uh, dominated by the Ndebele. Uh, so uh, you know, Rhodes is uh, 
uh, uh, his army defeats the Endebole kingdom in that first war. Uh, and this is followed by him occupying the Shona parts of uh, uh, Zimbabwe as well, in which the uh, leads to a new alliance between the Shona and the Endebole uh, and the Second Matabele War of 1896 to 97. Uh, both of these regions become uh, unified into the colony of southern Rhodesia in 1901. And then uh, several months later, uh, uh, Rhodes basically uh, you know, justifies his occupation by saying this was a uh, liberation of the Shona from the Ndebele minority who had been ruling. So again, this is something that you know, has a lot of echoes of the uh, 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 Hutu and Tutsi relationship in Rwanda there. And so uh, after all of this, uh, basically this war ends with the Ndebele leaders uh, uh, dead, their kingdom dissolved, uh, the British ruling, on the road towards kind of a self-governing colony in uh, what is uh, now known as Southern Rhodesia. Uh, notably, at the same time this is happening, uh, just to the south, uh, there's the German colony in what's the modern country of Namibia. The Germans are carrying out the genocide of the Nama and the Herero people, which is both the first genocide of the 20th century and the first genocide of the uh, uh, German state. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, again, you know, the uh, the British took over Rhodesia. They have the history of you no know, claiming that the Shona majority has actually been liberated from the Ndebele uh, monarchy that had been there before. And so, you know, white colonization is, you know, actually, you know, the liberation of the majority of the Africans. And this is again occurring in the context of just next door, the Nama Herero genocide in Namibia in South Africa, the same, or what is becoming South Africa in the Second Boer War uh, at the same time. This is also where the British invent the concentration camp and use it for the first time uh, against the Dutch, not against the uh, indigenous Africans. But, you know, very quickly uh, it spreads, you know, its use. And actually, right after this, it gets used by the United States and the Philippines. And so this is where, you know, a lot of the architecture for the genocides of the 20th century are being developed in this context. Uh, now, uh, Southern Rhodesia and Northern Rhodesia gets split off and becomes modern Zambia, but Southern Rhodesia is actually directly controlled by Cecil Rhodes's South Africa company until 1923, when it becomes this kind of hybrid self-governing colony, much like South Africa, where political power largely resided in the South, or the Rhodesian assembly, but that's a sen assembly where the elections are only allowed for whites. They have like a, like a small number of seats reserved for a very small number of uh, African electors. But essentially, this is white rule, but considered white self-government by the British Empire. Uh, and they developed very close economic ties with the Union of South Africa that's emerged uh, in the intermediary time. Uh, so in Southern Rhodesia, the Land Apportionment Act of 1930 legitimizes the transfer of uh, uh, the land to white ownership. Essentially, 90% of the land in Rhodesia is now owned by the around 8% uh, of the population who are the white settlers. Uh, there are efforts to kind of transition Rhodesia and the rest of Central African colonies in the British Empire to majority rule after World War II. Various you know, attempts to kind of cajole the white settlers of Rhodesia to accepting this. And much like South Africa did a few years earlier, in 1965, uh, the Rhodesian government decides they're just going to split with the British Empire entirely. They issue in 1965 something called the Unilateral Declaration of Independence, which is the first time since 1776 that a British colony has actually just on its own declared independence from the British Empire without any kind of agreement with London beforehand. So in 1965, Rhodesia becomes this pariah state where technically no other country you know, in the British Commonwealth accepts its independence, although in practical matters, essentially it, it is accepted as an independent country. But you know, much like South Africa, they're content just to go their own way. Uh, this is uh, carried out in the same time as a major crackdown with 
kind of the African political movements that are in southern Rhodesia at the time. There's a major movement uh, called the National Democratic Party that emerges in 1960. That's an African nationalist movement trying to end white rule. Uh, this gets banned uh, uh, prior to the UDI. And as a result, there's a new uh, political movement that emerges advocating for African rule. Uh, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, or uh, ZAPU, uh, which in turn is a splinter of the Zimbabwe African National Union, or ZANU. These are the two main political movements that emerge. And again, the idea that they're using the term Zimbabwe as their new country is because the ruins of the ancient city are seen as a unifying force that's agreeable to both to the Shona and the Ndebele. Uh, initially, ZAPU and ZANU uh, have the uh, uh, broad, no, they're not racial organizations, but quickly they become kind of centered in uh, uh, different ethnic groups. Uh, uh, ZANU's armed forces uh, uh, become associated with uh, uh, the Ndebele, kind of the smaller ethnic group. Uh, ZAPU become, or uh, ZANU is associated with the Shona, ZAPU becomes mainly Ndebele, and this is reflected by foreign uh, support as well. ZANU's forces uh, draw support from Mozambique, ZAPU from Botswana, Zambia starts supporting both sides. Internationally, the Soviet Union supports ZAPU, China supports ZANU, which kind of reflects different ideological and organizational tactics. And with China's support of ZANU, this draws in Vietnam, North Korea, Cuba to supporting ZANU, which is important because internationally, these are the countries that are seen as you know, non-white on the communist side. The Soviet Union by African nationalists is perceived as a white communist power. So again, the Ndebele minority party is being supported by the white communists. The majority Shona party is being supported by uh, the non-white communists, including North Korea, which becomes important later on. Uh, by this point, armed resistance has broken out uh, even prior to UDI. And, this is referred to uh, by the Rhodesian settlers as the Bush War, by the Africans themselves, they refer to this as the War of Liberation, or as they call it, the Second Chimarenga. And Chimarenga basically meaning revolutionary struggle. And they call this the second because the first Chimarenga has basically been retroactively applied to the earlier uh, Matabele Wars against the uh, Rhodesian settlers. And so there's this long arm struggle which becomes very brutal, especially near the end, but it ends with, uh, in 1979, the white settler uh, regime in Rhodesia collapses, there's a negotiated settlement, and in 1980, Rhodesia becomes uh, Zimbabwe, there are elections, uh, and uh, Robert Mugabe, uh, a Shona military leader who had been the chairman of ZANU since 1975, is elected the new prime minister of Zimbabwe. Uh, Mugabe's party, ZANU, wins an overwhelming majority of parliamentary <laughs> elections. And so in 1980, there is now an uh, independent African-dominated uh, Zimbabwe, which is uh, uh, now under the control of uh, Mugabe and the ZANU party. Uh, now again, you know, there are different uh, ethnic groups that are favored under colonialism, you know, like in Rwanda. This tends to you know, derive from the same kind of racial diasporic concepts as had fed into the great Zimbabwe legend. Uh, and again, the foreign rule that come, or the foreign support kind of feeds into some paranoia after ZANU achieves dominance. Uh, again, the Ndebele are majority in Western Zimbabwe, which means that the ZANU government is very paranoid about the possibility of kind of an uprising against their rule in the West. Uh, and so, uh, uh, the second like post-independent elections are scheduled for 1985. Going into those elections, uh, Mugabe uh, makes an agreement with North Korea to start training a new brigade in the Zimbabwean army, entirely formed of Shona members of the ZANU military. Uh, North Korea at the time is seen as kind of much more advanced than it is today, so this was actually seen as a major boon. Uh, and along with the North Koreans training this new brigade, Mugabe's government in 1982 claims to have found kind of caches of weapons in Ndebele strongholds in the West, 
among former ZAPU leaders. Uh, a number of NAA politicians are put on trial for, you know, accusations of trying to overthrow Mugabe. They're actually all acquitted because there's no evidence that's found, which also is kind of a problem. So legally, you know, he's tried to use the justice system to put down ethnic political enemies against his rule. When that fails, there is now starting the next year in 1983, uh, a military uh, campaign called the Gukurundi, which kind of means like the cleansing reign. And using the new North Korean trained 5th Brigade of the Army, uh, he sends the army against uh, the Ndebele strongholds in the West, not only arresting, but you know, uh, just killing with indiscriminate you know, violence major civilians, as well as uh, targeting uh, cultural political leadership of the Ndebele, of ZAPU, and again, actually some Shona political leaders who side with the Ndebeles, again, you know, kind of reflecting that the you know, uh, uh, moderates are also being targeted by the uh, Hutus in the Rwandan genocide as well. Uh, the end result of all this is that this violence, this uh, you know, targeted, coordinated uh, campaign of cultural as well as political destruction results in you know, what's estimated around 40,000 murders uh, and a larger number of uh, uh, arrests that happen as well. Uh, unsurprisingly, Mugabe's forces win the 1985 elections, which were kind of you know, the main target. And under pressure, kind of uh, the ZAPU political leadership is dissolved. They form an alliance with Mugabe's party kind of you know, at gunpoint. And you know, uh, Mugabe's rule is secure for a time. Although, again, there is a, a small postscript to this. Uh, in 1999, there's a new uh, uh, NAA political movement formed, uh, the Movement for Democratic Change. In 2008, Mugabe is almost uh, overthrown by this new alliance. Uh, and then finally, in 2017, uh, Mugabe is in fact overthrown but by his own uh, political party, the ZANU-PF because he had kind of tried to clear the way for his wife to become the new president after him. Uh, he fires in this purge uh, his existing vice president, which had the picture from here uh, on the uh, left, Emerson Minagua. Uh, Emerson Minagua had been the minister of state security during the Ndebele genocide in the 1980s. When Mugabe fires him from being vice president, he basically organizes a coup against Mugabe replaces him and uh, remains the president of Zimbabwe you know, up until today. Although again, there are a lot of questions about just what role he did play in uh, the Gukurundi genocide of the 1980s. He at least has always claimed uh, he was not involved though. Again, as he was the minister of state security, there's a lot of questions that you know he was not. So we do have something where at least in the 1990s, there is open like apologies from Mugabe from his government uh, towards the victims of the genocide, but the fact that arguably one of the architects is now president and very well entrenched also kind of opens questions of just how uh, 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 legitimate those apologies were. But you know, in the interest of time, I'll close out here, but we'll have a Q&A later, so any questions, happy to answer that. <laughs>